This is Synthesis TV, keeping you on the edge of technology and business. Back in 2019, there was a strange incident on a flight to New York City. What happened was a cart that uh, was being used to serve people refreshments hurt one of the passengers. He took it to a lawyer in New York. The lawyer, of course, decided to sue the airlines and he went to court in order to do so. He quoted a whole bunch of cases. The judge looked perplexed. The opposing attorney looked perplexed. And when they looked further into it, they realized that in fact he had used ChatGPT to form his argument. ChatGPT had in turn quoted cases that simply didn't exist. He was very embarrassed. He was shamefaced. He had to apologize. But what this indicates is the impact that AI, artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, is having on all of our lives. I'm Howard Feldman, and this is a Synthesis podcast. It is Synthesis TV, and we're joined today by Marie Nietlin, who is a principal for AI at uh, Synthesis, with uh, Hugo Labscher, who is part of the intelligence data team, and Catherine Depe, who is a corporate lawyer, a public speaker, and very involved in this space. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Hey. So, so the idea of today is really just to have a conversation about where all of this is going. It's quite, it's quite daunting because we see the impact that it's having. And before we started filming, in fact, we were talking about the fact that some companies are letting copywriters go. But if I get an email from somebody, I can tell immediately who wrote that article. So the impact is there. People are using it, but it clearly has a long way to go. Maria, let's just start with you. What are you seeing in, in the world, the incredible development and the speed at which all of this is, is, is developing? Yeah, I'm seeing that um, there is thousands of research papers being published each week mm -hmm. in AI, meaning there's a very active component to the research in improving these models. We we do have that problem that you mentioned with generative AI in general, that it can make up facts um, if you if you let it go and, and, and just use it without grounding it in some you know way to the truth. And there's a lot of research happening in that area to get the AI to be more truthful and be more helpful. But the the avalanche of, of AI is is unstoppable. And, and the research being done is unstoppable. So, you know, where will it end up? We we don't really know, but the questions are, should this be legislated or not? There's um, obviously being, um, there's, there's new acts being drafted, um, and we'll chat a bit about that. Um, We've got Elon Musk weighing in on it and say, you know, giving his view. Everybody's got a, quite a strong view on this. Everyone has a view, and, and the big players, OpenAI and Sam Altman and Microsoft and Google, who are leading this in terms of the large companies, they all have their views on should AI be regulated, or well, let's call it the this new strong generation of AI. Should it be regulated or not? Right, right. So so that becomes, uh, you got to visit me there. <laughs> and so, so this becomes the, the real question. Yeah. Okay, Catherine, if you can just talk. To, to what you've seen on, on, on the legal side. What happens if I'm a lawyer mm -hmm. and I have gone out and used, I've gone to court, it didn't happen in South Africa, but it will. Uh, it happened in New York. I go out and I quote cases that don't exist because I've relied on artificial intelligence. Look, it's definitely, I would say nothing short of the most serious and hottest topic at this point in time. I think especially uh, in the legal profession. In that specific case, you know, and I can go into a lot of detail, which I won't now, but ultimately, we always have to ask ourselves, especially in the legal industry, you know, what is our fundamental purpose when we are advising clients? What what are we supposed to be doing? Yes, our, you know, we would take we would take information, we would process it, we would analyze it from a legal perspective, and then we would give it to you. I would say that a lot of you care. thank you, and I was just about to say yeah, that yeah. in in that specific instance, it is really, um, you know, my my view 
that it is ultimately the responsibility of, of us in this professional space to take a lot of care when we are utilizing it. Yeah. I really feel that we will have to utilize it, but how we do it and how we present it to clients is actually going to be probably the more pressing question. Well, I guess it's no different to a doctor Googling somebody's symptoms, mm. right? They can do it and they can get an indication as to what what Dr. Google says, but the reality is they still need to know what what's going on. You know, they need to be able to verify, don't they? Or to develop the writing code. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I think it's um, we're definitely playing catch up right now. The capabilities of AI are progressing much faster than any existing or prospective legislature can keep up with. And I think that's a problem. You know, the, the world needs to step up in this regard. But I think what's going to happen is more emphasis is going to be placed on what the true role is, for example, of, of legal experts or medical practitioners. It's not simply to regurgitate what is already exists because these tools can do that quicker and cheaper than a human can do. But the, the emphasis then being on the expertise to take what, what exists and, and produce something new or something useful using the, the existing information. Well, it's interesting because I was speaking at a teacher's conference and we got into this conversation because one of the teachers said, well, if a student gives me an essay on Hamlet produced by ChatGPT, I'm just going to fail them. And everyone said, yes. And then somebody else said, hold on a minute, maybe not. Maybe we need to change how we're teaching and say, and teach our kids to be critical of what is being produced. Agree with it, disagree with it, showcase different things. Maybe our whole, our whole way of thinking, instead of saying, well, it's produced by somebody else, therefore it's not valid. Maybe we need to be, become more critical and that becomes our role. We're talking about code. I would imagine it's the same thing because I, I believe you can use ChatGPT to create code. So why do we need developers? And I love what you did because it's that critical thinking and that analytical approach, but also the, the hu human empathy side of things. So yes. as, as much as we have uh, uh, all of these AI models and all of these uh, tools that are going to be impacting and they are impacting almost every industry, the question then remains is in generations to come when we know that artificial intelligence is here and is going to continue to be here, how do we actually utilize it for the benefit in teaching, in education, um, and what is the human mind actually capable of really doing and therefore should we really be as fearful mm, as, as, as people yeah, are projecting? 100%. Well, going back to that now the coding question because yeah. for a developer, it could be quite a scary space to be in because why am I needed at all if if code can be written by chat GPT? I think that's a very important question to ask. And earlier we spoke about this this sort of dichotomy that's being formed. There's two cohorts of people. Either they fully embrace this kind of capability or they're sort of frightened by it. And I think um, the, Google and, and the search engine you know, functionality had the same impact for developers where um, you could just now just Google something on Stack Overflow and the code has already, already been written by someone else. Many new applications are just a patchwork of existing code and the world seems to be okay with that, but now not so much when it's been generated by an AI model. I think it, when we only care about whether or not something functions, it's less of an, of an issue. Where it comes to who owns that IP, that, that's a whole different, mm. different discussion to have. But functionally... I don't see it as different uh, you know, to the, the search engine because that's ex seemingly the same thing. It just uses what already exists and makes it more accessible. Did you see um, Google yesterday or the day before, a memo was leaked where they asked the developers not to use the internal um, generative AI bot to code and, and use the code in their products. Because they were saying it leads to less maintainable code and code with mistakes in them, which is so, quite funny because well, he's, come, well, he's actually wanting to use yes. tools for the top. So they're saying, there's there's a, really, like, we're not going to use it. And that's a bit, is it because of that or is it because the minute it's used in this forum, it becomes available to everybody else to use? Well, maybe if those companies train um, their bots right. on on data that we've put into it, 
Like if we put some proprietary coding and ask it to improve that, they might keep hold on to that and then retrain their models. And, and so in that way, you know, a lot of companies are worried that their IP might be exposed to right. the rest of the world. Exactly. But this is slightly different in that it is very saying that you oh, 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 it's, it's, it's quality of the output. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's a lot like the lawyer. Maybe developers also doesn't apply enough care when they um, receive a, a piece of code from a general AI to make sure that it's like functions as it intends mm -hmm. to. There may be underlying issues. And if you just take it at face value, you know. So that not, goes back to that same thing. Is, is same you thing. can't take it at face value. You what's, yeah, it, what's, what's interesting is, 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 is Marie, you've been playing around with us for a long time. Yeah. Before it became sexy, in truth. Yes, and, yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you created a language model. Uh, you took my articles and manuscripts, fed it into a language learning model and taught taught this to write it as I would write. Uh, right, yeah. how, how does this now differ? How, how, how is the, this next generation of artificial intelligence, AI, working uh, in, in terms of that? So this people have figured out how to, what we call align these models to certain tasks and behaviors. So initially, the models was only trained on this mass of data. So it was... They had a good understanding of languages, but it couldn't really like execute a task that you were asking for it, like mm -hmm. follow an instruction. Mm -hmm. And OpenAI and a few others have figured out that if we teach it out to follow instructions, it actually becomes um, a lot more useful for day-to-day -day tasks, solving day-to-day -day problems. And then they've added into GPT-4 another modality, which is not yet available to all our consumers. But that is to um, input images, process images, or input as images as well. And apparently, this created um, a lot more capability in this model to understand the world and reason about the world and give it more um, the ability to give more accurate answers, which is actually fascinating. Just by understanding visually the world, yes. you yeah. can also you know, produce better text. I think, that, and well, I can, to sort of summarize it, in essence, what made the, what constituted the jump from GPT three to ChatGPT and GPT four was, that they, by introducing this alignment task, they realized that it was plenty intelligent, but in the same way as you know that that an academic might be com very competent and intelligent, but put them in a business context and they don't really know how to navigate that. Wow, part. that's a that's a great analogy. Yeah, you know, sure. Have to teach us so the intelligence, but it actually doesn't have. The well, it doesn't have the EQ. It doesn't have the motivational skills. It doesn't have everything unless, unless you teach it. Unless you teach it, and it, it didn't know how to respond yeah. to humans, and that it, it learned to do that with the alignment songs. Yes, with getting a lot of feedback from humans as to what the type of responses the yeah. humans preferred, mm. and not, and now it's getting a lot better at. But but how does it discern what is rubbish out there? So somebody, you know, if we decide, and, and, and I've heard this spoken about that it's politically a little left-leaning, not right-leaning, because there might be more on the, uh, you know, more out there that is written from the one perspective and not another. How does it discern? And Because we almost seen it as this oracle, as this perfect truth, but it's anything but that, because what it's all it's doing is is doing a sweep of everything that's out there and feeding it back to us. Is is is, that, is my understanding right? I'm very lay person in this, <laughs> but well, thinking of a, a way of trying to describe it, but maybe we can describe it in terms of the human brain, where neurons are um, like reinforced, perhaps when you learn certain things. Yes, um, yes, and the same thing has got confirmation bias. It has digital because it's seeing it all the time. In this digital brain, the weights are being updated and changed so that certain con con concepts may become taboo. There's also yeah. the, the, this the way in which these models, specifically um, ChatGPT and GPT four, the way in which they are trained, these models are primed with a role that they are supposed to assume. This is where the responsibility moves to the companies that own these models, because, for example. ChatGPT's. Um, th there's been some experiments done where they could actually 
have it repeat its own setting or its role, the prompt message that, that primes this model. Wow. And that prompt message is, has been seen to favor the left uh, perspective mm -hmm. because, let's be honest, it's safer. When you have something that's public, public facing on the internet, it's a safer premise to have it be slightly more left-leaning than right-leaning. May I ask, uh, and, I, and it's, a, it's a really, I think, a very important question, especially for me, because I'm a layman like you in this technicalities, you know, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. But are we actually saying that um, that even once the AI is actually produced, so we take ChatGPT for an example, we then further direct how it is going to respond. So ultimately, humanity is then responsible for its outcome completely, which then is really important for us in the legal space. And I think this is why a lot of uh, lawyers, a lot of people in the legal industry will have to work very closely with, with the tech right, mm -hmm. to actually then understand if we want to manage it, I wouldn't say con control it, but manage it. And if we want to then regulate it, we would really need to understand it and optimize it. We would really need to understand these little tweaks uh, to make sure that it's actually uh, sustainable right. because we can't be forcing regulatory measures and not having it sustainable and workable. And I think this is... So I think you're right about that and it's interesting, but so if you take the same concept and and I'm, and, and I'm interested in what you're seeing in, from some of uh, the synthesis clients who are involved in this, is there's no doubt that the potential is vast and you could use it in business to streamline business to scale there's, there's there's everything that is potentially brilliant about it mm -hmm. but unless it is activated or implemented smartly it's got a potential downside as well what do you see it as the upside to businesses who want to adopt mm -hmm. so so i think you know we have a bit of a framework to help businesses adopt this and one of the first steps, there's sort of a five-step process, but one of the first steps is to take a people-first approach. Mm -hmm. Because there are actually a few things you need to do in order to deploy this. And one of them is get the people that are involved to learn and understand this technology and how to best utilize it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to help the clients roll this out responsibly and improve efficiency, et cetera. So help the the companies to um, remove things that are repetitive and things that are not bringing value necessarily um, to help the employees to you know mm -hmm. have more meaningful do many more meaningful work so if you can take a people first approach and like get their views and then upskill them and help them to generate the type of content that you need for training the models actually, playing a, a very important role in like aligning the models and AI uh, to the guess if you do that it is less fair because right yeah there's a lot out here about this so to add to this when when we synthesis implement a solution that utilizes an, a large language model we don't try to produce a black box as soon as possible um, we make sure that the people who are going to use this tool are literate in what goes in and what comes out of that solution and then secondly we make sure to build up a, a new model for the client. It's not just data that's being sent to the cloud and some output being returned because we don't know what's happening to that data. Mm. We make sure that it's enclosed in an in a secure and private environment where we know exactly what's happening with the data because when and inevitably, inevitably these large language models will produce something that's questionable, you can trace it back. You can understand why this happened. But if you just try to produce something that's flashy as soon as possible and you utilize the off-the-shelf products, you don't have control over what goes in and what comes out. You have to accept it as, you know, this is what I have. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. It's, you know, when, when we were talking before about the speed at which this is implemented, I kept thinking of, of Facebook where, where they had this enormous challenge with fake news and what was real or what wasn't real. And because of the, because of the speed at which Facebook grew, uh, they they could barely catch, they they just they couldn't keep up with this management of this and I, and it seems as though we're seeing the same thing here but maybe if what we're saying is is take a people first approach take a business first approach uh, keep make sure that we know who's responsible if I'm a lawyer I'm responsible for what I give a client or a teacher or a a doctor I still own 
the responsibility mm. and I'm actually not subcontracting that responsibility mm. for business, for, for the people side of it, for anything legal, medical, educational, etc. Then maybe if we adopt that framework, then we actually stand a chance of not only just managing this okay, but actually taking tremendous advantage of what is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, development. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I'm, um, the European Union has made a massive, massive progress in this from a legal and ethical perspective. So at the moment, uh, when you look at this question that you raise, which for us as lawyers is really important, is this um, question around accountability and responsibility, which ties into these legal words such as liability and oh, sure. who's responsible for what. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so the Artificial Intelligence Act is actually in draft phase at the moment. And it's really what I would say, it's, it's a wow. It's a wow factor. However, there is going to be and there is significant um, debate around it as to whether it's actually going to do what what the intention is yeah. because of the technology right? and and sometimes the with the speed of legislation doesn't nearly match the speed of development yes. and, and that's how we and the timing of it mm -hmm. um and then the question goes around you know um will it actually be successful however what we are seeing is that there's definitely a very positive movement to firstly utilize the ai but utilize it responsibly uh, or as, as responsibly as, as we, we can, can. Yeah. um very, very yeah. interesting indeed. It's unfortunately all we do have time for, Marie. Uh, I'm going to leave the last, uh, the last question to you. What is the most exciting? What excites you about this area? I mean, I've always wanted a computer to like give it an instruction, and it comes back with something intelligent, does something intelligent, does something higher at a higher order. You know, since I was exposed to computers, it was always kind of. You had to tell it in detail yeah, what yeah. to do, you know, and we're getting to a level where I can issue high level instructions so and yeah. the task gets performed and that's kind of interesting. But I must say, uh, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed sometimes by, you know, what I think, uh, can this, these models can accomplish. And sometimes that holds you back a bit. In trying to explore all the possibilities because you're so overwhelmed. <laughs> Which is interesting because if you're overwhelmed and you're involved with it, can you imagine what the rest of us feel? Uh, <laughs> we, you know, we just wonder if we're even going to exist in six months' time in this space. <laughs> but I think the, the answer there is to be guided by people who are engaged, who understand it, who understand the complexity around it. And, and it, instead of denying it and ignoring it, confront it, deal with it, and actually take advantage of it. We'd love your thoughts and your reactions. Place them in the comments below. Subscribe to our channel. We're going to be doing a series of, of artificial-related conversations, intelligent data, trying to unpack this field from various uh, angles and from various perspectives, how it impacts on your business, what you can do to take advantage of it and uh, to, to help to assist your business your education or anything that you are involved with. Uh, thank you to our, this morning's panelists. It's been a fantastic conversation. I'm Howard Feldman. This is Synthesis TV.